sleeping on laptops, sleeping on floors. It's everywhere. I mean, it, people are just trying to do what they got to do to survive it. Not an easy go of it. Many travelers still stranded following the onslaught of a horrible winter storm. Drivers in Raleigh, North Carolina became trapped in huge traffic jams and abandoned their cars on highways and state roads. Thousands remain without power this morning or today rather after the storm pelted the region. The powerful storm caused at least 12 deaths and could could dump more than a foot of snow on parts of the northeast today. And I'm hearing from my business community, from individuals, that Obamacare is a train wreck. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham there talking about the train wreck continuing for Obamacare. Signups for the president's signature piece of legislation remain troubling as the deadline clock runs down. Only 25% of signups were from that key demographic needed to make the health insurance pool work. More troubling, 55% were women who use more medical care than men, studies show. The administration has yet to release how many of those people have even paid for their policies that have signed up. And, of course, Saturday marks Youth Enrollment Day for health care plans, pa uh, plans rather on healthcare.gov. So how is the administration celebrating? By shutting down healthcare.gov for maintenance. The motion to concur in the House Amendment is agreed to. And the Senate has passed the debt ceiling bill a blow to Tea Party Republicans, some are saying. The vote Wednesday averts another potential government shutdown for at least a year. The move allowed the government to borrow more money to pay its bills through March of 2015. The vote was a last hurdle to get the bill to the president's desk. But what does it mean for consumers? We'll have more on that later in the show. And major news affecting the future of TV viewing for tens of millions of Americans. Comcast announcing its plans to buy Time Warner Cable in a $45 billion deal. The acquisition will combine the two largest cable companies in the United States. The merger expected to receive government approval will take effect by the end of the year. But what is its potential impact on consumers as well? Good to have you with us here. David Patton, yeah. senior editor of Newsmax magazine. This is a big deal, this Comcast merger. Uh, we've become accustomed to hearing about these mega mergers with other companies and other industry sectors. But this is personal because this is where we get our information from. Absolutely. And Conservatives do have some concerns with Comcast and the idea that it's going to be getting even bigger. I mean, this is a company that right now, for example, through its Comcast Ventures is bankrolling the uh, wunderkind of liberal left-leaning journalism, Ezra Klein, the former Washington Post sure. blogger, uh, very highly regarded for his analysis, but it's consistent, consistently from the left. They're underwriting him. They, do, they and uh, their people donated over $300,000 to President Obama's reelection campaign and its affiliated organizations in the last cycle, more than three times as much as was donated to Mitt Romney's campaign. So conservatives are going to keep a real wary eye on this and see how it proceeds through Congress. And I think Congress really needs to take a close look at this one and make sure that we're not narrowing down the information sources for Americans. Yeah, and you know, there's a, the other issue of here when you deal with utilities, like, you know, I guess for the most part it's a utility because we've come to rely on this stuff so much uh, that the, you know, the American consumer will have fewer choices on where they get their information from, and that means you know, perhaps potentially worse customer service, higher mm -hmm. uh, charges as well. So a lot of uh, things to, to keep our eye on there on the Comcast. We also, of course, want to talk about Obamacare, something you might be a little bit more uh, <laughs> familiar with uh, right now. The Health and Human Services uh, Department announced that enrollment in the Obamacare private exchanges has dropped off significantly in January. The drop off is a reduction of about 29 percent. It seems clear that the administration will not, will not reach its estimated goal of 7 million enrollees by the March 21st deadline. And HHS still won't say how many people have actually paid their Obamacare premiums. So David, uh, now as we to concur in the House Amendment. So now as we look at this, uh, but again, so we, we get more bad information about Obamacare. We just saw the president kind of responding there. He seems uncomfortable talking about it, and maybe he should. But overall, you, from the administration, you get kind of just a shoulder shrug uh, about this type stuff. So there have been something like 29 major changes to this law. Essentially, a vast rewrite of the law has taken place since the point that it was actually passed. It kind of makes you wonder, uh, well, gee, what is the law? And I love it when President Obama comes on and he says, we're going to be beneficent and we're going to let these businesses, we'll give them a break and out of our wisdom as the federal overseers of now one-sixth of the economy, health care. Uh, you know, come on, let's get real. The reason they're doing it, and even people on the left, Ron Fournier, uh, Kirsten Powers, 
Uh, we just heard from Rick Unger. You know, they're saying now, you know, we're tired enough already. This is pure politics. So the numbers are suspicious. The law's being changed at will. And Americans at some point have to start wondering what the heck's going on with this administration and this law. Yeah, we heard, uh, you know, Dick Morris kind of talk about this as Chinese water torture um, with every day see a new problem arising with Obamacare. And, and we've heard liberal pundits having a hard time defending it. The president even there seems unsure when he has to speak to the American people. So, you know, the question I've asked you before and mm. you want to ask, what is the tipping point here? When yeah. is, you know, is it, is it mm -hmm. going to have to wait for Election Day? Yeah, well, I think uh, that's the big question. Be and the reason that, that that's probably the case is that it's very evident Republicans, uh, Republican strategists are putting all their chips right in the middle of the table and they're putting the bet down on Obamacare. There are a lot of people center left who think that Americans are going to get tired of this issue, that the news is so negative that they'll just want to say, look, enough already. I don't want to hear any more about that thing. Uh, but Republicans think that this is a gift that keeps on giving. There's a lot of key Senate races where uh, the Democrats trying to defend their seats, Kay Hagan in North Carolina, for example, were very strong proponents yep. of Obamacare. They're on record saying that. They're going to see those oppo ads, and there's nothing more devastating than an opposition ad that just quotes the candidate because that's not spin. Yep. That's you, what they did. You can't run from that uh, <laughs> when, when you have that information on, on the screen. Now, we are going to talk about Obamacare in just a second. And uh, I'm mean, sorry about the debt ceiling increase in just a second. Mm -hmm. That's a today's story. But mm -hmm. uh, we, we are insinuating this is a win for Democrats here. But mm -hmm. in, in other ways, we heard Steve Scalise phrase it. It's also a win for Republicans because we're going to talk about the debt ceiling for one day mm -hmm. today. Yeah. But tomorrow, we'll be back talking about yeah. Obamacare again. Yeah, so we're hearing a lot of talk in the media, who's the winner, who's the, the loser, that kind of horse race mentality of the media. I think you could make an interesting case uh, that everybody got what they wanted. Everyone got something from this vote. So what did Democrats get? They got the uh, clean raising of the debt ceiling that they insisted on. Uh, what did the establishment Republicans get? Well, they wanted to get this issue of the debt ceiling off the table so all of the public's attention would be focused on Obamacare, which again they feel is the key issue that will decide the outcome. Then you get to grassroots Republicans and Tea Party types. Now what would they have liked to have gotten? A smaller government, what they call constitutional size government, uh, limits if not the complete repeal of Obamacare, at least changes to Obamacare. None of those things were going to happen in a divided Congress. So at least what they get secondarily, their second choice is, they get to go to their constituents and say, this doesn't have my fingerprints on it. I didn't vote on this. I had nothing to do with it. So rather than look at it as winners and losers, you could look at it like everybody got what they felt they needed out of this vote. Yeah, let's take a step back a, a real quickly and just refresh folks who might just now be tuning in about what happened uh, last night on the Senate floor. Uh, not everybody tunes in as closely to what happens on the Senate floor as we do, but here's a review. The Senate passed uh, the debt ceiling bill, uh, which will avert a potential government shutdown now, at least until March of 2015. The Senate approved the House a uh, passed measure that allows the government to extend its borrowing authority. Um, you know, it's still a question of who is the winner and who is the loser here, D Dave, but particularly uh, it puts an interesting contrast in the cell division that's going on within the Republican Party and even more on a granular level within Texas because you have mm. John Cornyn, mm. a guy who has an incredibly high rating from a lot of conservative groups. Uh, nobody would, who really follows politics would accuse John Cornyn of not being a serious conservative. Right. But then in, in the same state, he's got Ted Cruz in the same delegation. Yeah, he's got Ted Cruz in the dead, uh, same delegation. He's got some tough primary opposition Steve from the Stockman. right, Steve Stockman who is very closely allied with the grassroots and the Tea Parties, which are extremely active and powerful in the Lone Star State. So it's very curious that you have minority leader Mitch McConnell, who knows he's got to protect his right flank. He has Matt Bevin out there in Kentucky. You've got Cornyn in Texas now. And they're both uh, going along with this uh, really, in, in a way, wholeheartedly, knowing that this is going to probably kind of inflame activism on the right against their candidacy. So you got to kind of wonder what's what's the plan here? Right. Because yeah, exactly. Yeah. What is the plan here? Because, you know, as we've seen over and over again, you know, we have these people who are great spokespersons or, mm -hmm. you know, great spokesmen, great spokeswomen for the conservative movement. But, but when they're candidates, that's mm -hmm. when the you know, when the, the game is being played, that's where the, where the mm -hmm. trouble arises. Sure. Um, you know, and there's, uh, you know, two different we're talking about Steve Stockman and, and John mm -hmm. Cornyn here. This is not something that John Cornyn as the Senate whip 
uh, wants to deal with this time of year. No, I mean, he's got plenty of other things that he could turn his attention to. And it's an interesting question. You know, you get the sense, both in Boehner's decision in how to handle the vote in the House, and then the way the, the Senate Republicans basically helped steamroller this thing through. And the fact that establishment Republicans didn't try to at least get Democrats on the record, as far as some of the other really contentious, difficult stances. Uh, how would a Mary Landrew handle a vote on the Keystone Pipeline? Uh, what about some of the uh, limits on individual mandate for health insurance? Th polling shows these would be very successful, but they didn't even try to attach these as writers. It makes you wonder if the establishment in Washington hasn't pretty much thrown up its hands and said, look, uh, we're either going to uh, play politics successfully in the way we've been used to doing it in the paradigm for the past 20, 25, 50 years in Washington, or we may not play at all. It may be time to move aside. It's hard to imagine they would do that, but again, you got to wonder what's the what's the larger plan here for them. Interesting stuff. Uh, we'll have more uh, about the debt ceiling, um, you know, as we continue to follow the political mm -hmm. fallout uh, of all of this. Uh, you know, we we saw there was a, a quote from John McCain and uh, the great article uh, in Politico today about kind of the behind the scenes uh, drama that went on last night uh, in the chamber. John McCain said it was a very courageous thing for Mitch McConnell to do. Uh, do you believe that? No, I mean, I think that it was a very um, calculated thing for Mitch McConnell to do. I think it's a very establishment Republican thing for Mitch McConnell to do. I do think that, in, in a sense, ultimately, let's step back and look at the big picture. The fact is, Republicans were never going to stop this from happening. They were burned from the shutdown before, and they took such a hit in the polling that had they really pushed this thing to the wall, which is what the grassroots wants them to do, that it would have had probably devastating consequences in November, an election where the GOP is pinning all of its hopes on retaking the Senate. That would be basically political madness. So I think what you have to look at is not so much why uh, didn't they try to do the impossible, they could never do that with the divided power in Washington, but why didn't they at least try to get something? Why didn't they at least play some politics with Democrats to try to make them take some stuff, tough stance so that when they went out on the campaign trail, they would have to defend some of these votes that now they can say, hey, I didn't have anything to do with Keystone. That was the president's choice. Yeah, interesting stuff. Let's also talk about uh, Chris Christie and Scott Walker, uh, a guy that a lot of conservatives are paying attention to because of his, ex his success uh, dealing with unions. He came out saying that he believes uh, Chris Christie through the whole uh, bridge scandal. I won't say bridge gate. I hate to say that, but uh, what do you think? Is this a smart move by Walker? He must have some information uh, because a lot of conservatives have been kind of reluctant to come out and back Christie after all this. Well, um, certainly Christie, a powerful player in Republican politics still, uh, the head of the Republican Governors Association. So that would be a bridge that uh, Scott Walker would like to hold on to if he can. But don't forget the rest of that statement, John, was that Scott Walker said, if no other revelations come out. So I believe him, assuming no more bad news comes out about Christie. What did he know about the bridge gate? When did he know it? What role might he have played either before, during, or after? Uh, we had a report come out that perhaps Christie was in a helicopter that had flown over the bridge, and that report was debunked yesterday. We now know that that was not the case. And so we're going to have to wait and see. But uh, Scott Walker is still playing it a little bit cagey, uh, unlike, for example, Sarah Palin, who basically came out and kind of threw Christie under the bus and said, how could a governor not know what their own people were doing uh, with a major bridge? I think she's got a, a pretty good point there. Uh, on the debt ceiling, back to that, we finally heard from uh, some of you folks at home. We want to get to some of your comments uh, from Facebook right now. This one coming from L.J. Friedman. There should be a balanced budget. If politicians pay, uh, should pay for the first cut, mandatorily, be the first cut to help balance the budget. Second, no politician allowed to run for re-election if the budget is not balanced. Thanks a lot for that, L.J. And Lori Gibson writing to us, it is total gross negligence for Congress to continue raising the debt ceiling at all, considering the massive debt uh, continual borrowing into near bankruptcy. Balancing the budget as mandated must be done instead or we are doomed. And Jim Cutting, stop raising the debt limit, stop the ignorant spending and spending millions to fund our 
other countries that hate us. Most important of all, get the spending fraud out of the White House. Good stuff coming from our viewers there. We want to hear from you as well, as always, on social media. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, me personally, John B underscore Newsmax, and also all of us here at Newsmax TV. We'll be right back after this.